last Sunday you mentioned that you've been in some low places. Your testimony wore our eyes throughout the sanctuary. We see nice clothes and laugh at your jokes, but we never realized how empty you may have been at that moment. You are the epitome of the saying, you have to laugh to keep from crying. How have your valley moments shaped your ministry? Man, leaning on God. I guess one of my lowest places, I've had several. Very low place when my mother suddenly died of a heart attack. And so I felt lost. I felt empty. I didn't want, that was low. And so after my mother's demise, I had to put on more garments to care for my dad, who was elderly and ill, who we would have suspected to have died first. But you know, God got his own timing. And so I had to care for him. And uh, we had some very low places where I had to sleep on the floor at the hospital. Because as you know, if you don't know, I tell you, don't leave your parents in the hospital alone. And so after my father passed, and I often say, my sisters often say, that had my parents been alive, I wouldn't be in Jackson because I wouldn't have left them. And I believe that's right because I've had opportunities to go to other churches even before coming to this area, had uh, opportunity to apply in St. Louis. But at that point, my mother and father were living and I knew they were getting up in age and I didn't go because I wanted to be there, you know, for them. And so after moving to Jackson, it was uh, a sense of a new beginning because I moved here in uh, 2013 and my dad died, my dad who I speak of died in July 18th of 2013. And so I moved here and after getting here, I, of course, I ran into some good people. And I ran into some booger bears. But the good outweigh the bad. That's why I'm still here. But my lowest place was pulling up to the campus that Sunday morning to see people dressed in civilian clothes ready to go to any extreme of violence to fight against an innocent man simply because they had odds basically with themselves and didn't want to adhere to leadership. That was low because I, I really felt like one of the disciples, Master, I left everything to follow you. And so I felt that, man, hey, my mother died three years ago. My father just died. And I came here to a city where I knew basically nobody and had no family. And getting dismissed from a church and taken into court and news media and all on YouTube and and I knew I hadn't done anything. And so I would say that that was probably one of my lowest points in ministry. Now, you want me to tell you about the high? Or that's another question. But my, my, my lowest point was to have to go home alone at night. And I literally... Many nights, cried myself to sleep, wondering, am I dreaming? These are some of the same folk that were just shouting on Sunday. So that was an unexplainable low place because in many cases, you're innocent until proven guilty. But in the realm of church, church people 
Church is some of the, church people are some of the worst people you, you can ever deal with because instead of being innocent until proven guilty, most church people have you guilty and you never proven innocent. And so I've, I've had to live with that. I walked in restaurants and um, people, S -s 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 -s, that's him, that's him. That make you feel bad when you haven't done anything to anybody. But I will say this. I've had many things, and that was one of them, that may have made me cry, but nothing has made me crumble. So after going through that, in the midst of that, going through that, crying at home, but my head was held high when I stepped out. Because remember, stepping out, I was going to be shot, and I was going to have a nice ride. Not that that mean nothing, but you can't let nobody see you down. And you go through life with that uh, mentality also. And so it may make you cry, but don't let it make you crumble. So the highlight from that was that first Sunday, I think it was the first Sunday in April 2015 when we used West Haven uh, Funeral Home Chapel. Uh, those two weeks that we were going through that before the official service, I hear people calling or texting, I'm with you, I got you back, coming to my house, we with you, we this. But people can say anything with the mouth. <clears throat> Doesn't take much for people to switch up, switch sides for opportunity. And so I had something to do that. But my highlight was to pull up that Sunday morning and see so many people who was there, in my opinion, to support little old bit of me. When I had some in there say, go back to Sugar Ditch and do this and do that. I mean, it was awful. So that was one of my highlights was to pull up. At that point, we had no name because we wasn't a church. We were just in a squabble. And the second portion of my highlight was, I would say, to officially find out that I had that many people willing to stay with me and stand with me and start a church. And um, I could go on and on with highlights, but I will say the good outweigh the bad. Accomplishments make us feel, in a certain sense, that we have arrived. Although we know there is far more to accomplish in life, and we continue to strive toward greatness, what is something not related to ministry that you have accomplished that makes you proud? What gives you a show enough shout when you think about how far you have come? Well, I married a pretty woman. That's enough to make a show enough shout. Uh, not only is my wife a beautiful woman, smart woman, she loved God, she loved me, love the children and much of what you see in my ministry at this point is because of her and so you said outside of ministry it would have to be marrying my wife I just beat up on myself so bad I waited too long but um, I did it just in time though she still get the best part of me, you know. COVID-19 came and disrupted our nation. It forced churches to close their doors. It forced schools to shift to virtual learning. It caused businesses to shift to employees working from home. The everyday life as we knew, March 1st, 2020, no longer exists. As we transition back to our new norm, what are your thoughts on those who are scared to return to the sanctuary but have res resumed all other activities? Well, let me back up. Let me add something to your question. Your daddy is the reason I closed church doors after he and I converse. Of course, you know I'm very stern and strong-headed. So he and I communicated. He said, well, 
Pastor, you know, stuff kind of bad. You know, your dad, how he talked to me, you know. Pastor, you know, you are, you know. And it's the same. But it's your car and everything you say, he's going to put it back on me. You know, kind of like getting food and throwing it back. I will eat some of it, but you get some first. That's how he operate, right? And so I wasn't going to close church. I didn't care what happened. And let me say this. I wasn't going to close, and I won't close again on no circumstance. I felt very guilty. And I think people have gotten so comfortable. Many of them are comfortable not being in the sanctuary because of COVID, but they go everywhere else. So I just don't, you probably don't want me to answer that question if you want me to have members to come back. But um, I'm very disappointed to, a, to, a, to an extent. So to say that you're safer at home when I know people that have died that didn't go anywhere. So I don't think I need to dwell on that because I, my interview would go bad. But I would say to those, get back in church. Get back in the assembly with the saints. Don't stay out of church. We have all experienced some bumps in the road. That doesn't make us give up but it makes us reflect and identify areas that are in need of improvement. Looking back over your 20 years in the ministry, is there one specific thing that you would have done differently? Well, yes. Of course, as you know, I got married very young, my first marriage, and I'm grateful for my wife and my family, don't get me wrong. But I kind of wish sometimes that I would have worked things out a little different in my previous marriage. Because I feel that I haven't, and I've done all I can, but I think I could have done even more with my children because there's still a portion of their life that I've had to miss. And I've been there, don't get me wrong, but it's nothing like being there, going to sleep with them, waking up with them, and all of that. So that, that would be one thing, but I got married very young and listening to church people and things of that nature. But um, I think o overall, I've, I've worked through that, but, um, it, it was my life at that point. Balancing church and family is not something that you can put on a scale and it measures 50-50. Often pastors struggle with realizing what is priority when it comes to the church and familial responsibilities. They may take action on the minor and neglect those things that are major. What has helped you learn balance over the years? What advice would you give to a new pastor who is struggling to balance the two? I don't know how to balance. Church is my life. What has blessed me is, according to know me, so she's nobody that I got to impress with saying, as some do, stand up before audience and, oh, I'm going to do this with my family first and I'm going to do this. A lot of that's not true. I don't have much balance. I just work with the hand that I'm dealt. So to say honestly that I have balance with church and ministry, no, because really we hadn't even got as busy as we're going to get with the vision that God has given me for this church. So we haven't started yet. Church hurt has been a major topic of discussion among social media platforms. The topic has been used to justify the behaviors of individuals and their in attendance in corporate worship. How do you feel about this? Some things, Chloe, I would say not hurt. Some things just people don't want to be obedient and they don't want to adhere to leadership. Uh, we have a new thing going on now that if I'm displeased over here I just go over there and when I go over there I talk about how bad over here was 
when it's not the case. Sometimes it's not the people or not, shall I say, the ministry or other people in ministry. But sometimes you have to check yourself. It's that person. And so I don't know what is really the mentality for people professing to be so hurt in church. I mean, you ought to have some structure. Don't get structure and hurt mixed up. Because if me, or a pastor per se, telling you what's right, if that hurt you, then we can change the name of this church to Hurt Baptist Chapel. Everything in ministry won't be sweet. And it won't always be the way the parishioners desire for it to be. But the end result is what I preached this morning. Whatever we endure is to give God the glory. So a lot of uh, church hurt is not church hurt. A lot of it is disobedient people coming to the church. And it's not church hurt, it's hurt feelings. Hooping is a celebratory style of black preaching that pastors typically use to close a sermon. Some church scholars compare it to opera. It's that moment the, the sermon segues into song. One of the things that you are known for is hooping. People brag about how you killed it. Some say you would tear a house down. Recently, your method of delivery has shifted from hooping to teaching. What effect do you feel that this shift has on your members and the people who follow your ministry? Well, I know. I still can do it. I, I, I enjoy hooping. It's, it's a part of me, a part of my upbringing, of course. But I wouldn't say it was preaching. It, as you said, it's the climax. It's celebration. But I've shifted to more teaching because, as I always say, learn people are better people. And due to COVID, we haven't had our traditional Bible study. And so since we haven't, I've been trying to intertwine my Bible study with my Sunday message. But ultimately, also trying to shift the dynamics of the church because once again, I know where we're headed. And you can't reach who you don't teach. And so hooping can only do so much. It make them feel good for today. But teaching them will get them developed for tomorrow. And so I'm, uh, Jesus said, go and make disciples. If they already were, you wouldn't have to make them. And so teaching help develop people. And you can only develop those who want to be developed. I've heard people say when you don't hoop, you hadn't preached. They don't know any better. But those who want to be developed, they are developed through the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I plan to keep hooping until I die. But I, I don't hoop all the time. And I've geared, as again, I'm enjoying the teaching. And I believe it's blessing the people. Everything rises and falls on leadership. We see churches in great locations that struggle because of bad leadership. We see churches with great preaching struggle because of poor leadership. So, we know that leadership matters and it rests on vision. We are listening when you say God gives the vision to the pastor. He tells you what? he is going to do before he reveals how and the when. We know that you have expressed that big things are in store for unity. We are excited and cannot wait to see what God will do for our ministry. With the vision that God has provided you, where do you see unity in the next decade? Well, first of all, I see a full-time ministry, meaning a full-time staff, uh, people working every day. And most of all, I see us in a new sanctuary. My desire is to build uh, a multi-million dollar sanctuary. And uh, from there, I plan to 
you guys get her and go to college and send your ties back. I plan to do something, uh, a community center or a, a, a um, extracurricular activity building where we have activities and special things for children. And so that's why I see unity in the next 10 years. That's just a tip of the iceberg, but uh, ultimately the highlight of the next decade is a new sanctuary. And if you want me to really be happy, it's not just to be in it, but paid it off. That concludes our interview. Thank you for having us, Pastor Franklin. I thank you for interviewing me. Thank you, bright young people. Jackson police were called out to a dispute at a church this morning.
Orlando D. Franklin of Unity Fellowship Baptist Church is celebrating his 20th anniversary. The celebration kicks off Wednesday, July 20th with guests Pastor R.K. Moore. Thursday, the 21st, Pastor Terry Davis. Friday, the 22nd, with Pastor Jamal Bodie. 7 p.m. each weeknight. And get ready for a full weekend. Saturday, July 23rd, we're praying and brunching. Family and friends game night. Enjoy Pastor Cedric Lear for the anniversary Sunday service. And a gospel explosion at Unity Fellowship Baptist Church, 5609 Clinton Boulevard, Jackson. Learn more on Facebook at Unity Fellowship. BC.